Welcome everybody to another edition of In The Spotlight and I'm very pleased to be joined by a very familiar face. If you're watching BBC, you uh, recognise him very much. Uh, Gavin Ramion, thank you very much, mate, for joining me. I really appreciate it. How's no the problem, lockdown James. treating you? Yeah, oh man, like it's, it's weird, isn't it? It's weird. It's like, you know, all the things we used to take for granted, James, are like just out the window now, aren't they? You know, it's... Um... Weird times, weird, uh, weird vibes, but I guess we've, we're all in it together, aren't we? So we've just got to keep going, keep strong, I think. What have you learned most about you in lockdown? Oh, man, geez. Um, well, I'll tell you something. I, may, I actually have learned that I'm probably not as, not as strong and resilient as I think I might have been. Um, because normally, you know, you, you, you would think, oh, it'd be the other way around. But I actually, I didn't, I didn't realise how much, like, I remember, like, you know, because I've been, I have to go to, to work and still, I'm on, still on quite a bit still. Um, and you know, it's, it's quite, at first it's refreshing in a way when there's nobody around and obviously, you know, you take precautions and stuff, but, um, when you're, um, when you're like kind of, you know, three or four weeks in, you start thinking, this is just not right. This is just very, very eerie. Um, and then it becomes quite depressing and it becomes quite demotivating. So I think, uh, for me, I've learned that actually I crave, you know, people, human, human contact um you know being around like energy being around souls i think that i i'm i suppose like, what i've learned most is that i you know i really am a people person and i think a lot of other people might say the same really as well that I, I, there are times when don't get me wrong i i am craving my own space you know i like my own time like my own th to do my own thing but this this period has actually shown me that you know something we should appreciate others more more frequently i think I was going to say, do you think it's a kind of a period that we're all learning so much from? And that key point you mentioned about being around people, how many times do we say, oh, you know, you say no to going out with friends for a night or, oh, I just fancy a quiet night in tonight. Yeah. Do, you th yeah. do you think for yourself that's going to change when this lockdown ends? Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, to be honest, James, I've always been one for like making the effort to try and go out and see people. I've, mm. I'm quite a... Um, I like to make the most of the time, you know, I, I, I do believe that, you know, because I'm in between two cities, it's, it's quite hard to see everybody when you need to see them. So when you get an opportunity to, I do try and make the effort. But having said that, um, I will cherish it more. Um, I'll take it more, more appreciation of it. And I'll cherish the, the times when we do go out and socialize and hang out because this, you know, this period now is, is, uh, is really, really hurting. So I think right now, I think that that, that point is, is uh it's very interesting because we probably took that for granted as you said you know mm. it's it, it you know when you go out and hang out with people down the pub down the down the you know down the um you know wherever the gyms or wherever it is you, you hang out with people those sorts of like opportunities you know go for coffee with people and whatever and you know go for dinner and stuff and lunch those sorts of times like they were always very oh yeah you know next week whenever you know it's always very laissez-faire whereas now it's like i'll i'll cherish those times and those occasions much much more um pertinently I think, because before it was just like, ah, whatever, you know, you and I are both social people. We know mm -hmm. what it's like to kind of like, you know, hang out, shoot the breeze, catch up, etc. cetera. Um, that, when that's taken away, you, you feel it. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's just strange, isn't it? It's so strange yeah. because, yeah, I'm the same as you. A bit of a social butterfly, as my mum would describe me as. And yeah. spending time with people, little catch-ups, coffees. But I definitely at times just went, oh, God, I just, I just want to chill at home. I just want to chill at home. Yeah, 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 yeah. Six weeks later, I don't ever want to chill at home again. You know? Oh, my God. Yeah, I, I was just saying, actually, earlier today, um, you know, the idea of binging a box set or, like, catching up on some, you know, content or TV that you've been meaning to for a while, um, you know, that, that for me is like, oh, that's like a, that's a little goal at the end of, like, a busy day or busy week. Um, whereas now it's kind of like the default for a lot of people. And I'm like, um, you know, I have it at my disposal now, but it's, it's, it sort of feels wrong to do it. So all the things that you think, oh, actually, you know, I look forward to that, you know, a couple of days time or three or four days time, um, you know, you, you're getting around to it now and you're thinking, ah, oh, you know what, I don't really want to do this. I want to be out working again or like doing, you know, my usual lifestyle again and, you know, being kind of busy and whatever and, you know, just just kind of going with the flow. Whereas you're kind of forced to do this now or forced mm. to find things to do. And it's yeah, it can be difficult. It can be difficult. But at the same time, it can also give you a bit of perspective, you know, give you a bit of you know, reality, because it can make you think about things, you know, it makes you stop and actually realize and maybe take a bit of um, stock of like how things are going and how, you know, you, you're assessing life and your goals and what you want to achieve and, you know, your plans. There's loads of things to think about in this period. And I think that um, it's an amazing opportunity to do that. But then 
you know, those plans need to be put into action. I guess, you know, when, when things hopefully do get back to normal as soon as, that's when the time is to act on that. So have you reassessed? Yeah, massively. Yeah, massively. I think I, I, would, I would say so. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff I had um, planned to do uh, in my downtime when I've, I've got like a huge to-do list, you know, as, as we've spoken about before with <laughs> things that are on my uh, to-do list. I've got loads to do still, um, but it, it just continues to grow. And I think now it's not a case of me just n- knocking off things on that to-do list. It's still growing, believe it or not. <laughs> but I think I'm just assessing what actually needs to really be done. So mm-hmm. I would say that um, I've acted on the fact that there are things on there that I didn't really need to do. I've reprioritized, I think, is the way to put it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you mentioned just a second ago about traveling up on the train. I know you're based in London. You're working in Manchester at the BBC right now. So you're one of very few people now that are commuting back and forth. How's that journey? Because usually you're probably crammed in, you're sat down, every seat's taken yeah. at peak times. Now you're, I know I've seen on your social media where you posted a video where you're in an empty carriage looking yeah. up going, no one's here at all. <laughs> How <laughs> eerie is that feeling? What's that feel like? Oh, man, yeah. I mean, I, I don't do it very often. Um, I do it sort of like when I do a, a small batch per, um, per run that I'm on. So I don't, don't go up like every other day or something. So I try, I very much keep to a minimum. Um, but when... You know, it's, it, the service is there for key workers and for people who, you know, are essential workers to get up and down to the north um, and they're less frequent. Um, but having said that, it's it's still it's still very, very strange when you're the only person on pretty much the whole carriage. Uh, you know, I would say one of one of 10 people on the whole train, which is designed for around, what, say, 500 people. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, though, it's, it's one of the most odd things ever. At first, it's kind of. You know, I thought to myself, this is this is actually luxury. You know, it's like there's no one around for the whole thing to myself. As much space as I want, no one's bothering me. No one's talking to me. Whatever it is, you know, you've got the, the time to do things. But now, like, it, it just doesn't feel right. You know, it's, it, mm-hmm. it feels like it's you know uh, all that kind of novelty at, fir- at first has now worn off, and you feel wrong doing it. You feel like, you know, this isn't this isn't what the general consensus and the general population is doing. So you feel like. Uh, yeah, if I have to do this, I do it. But it doesn't f- it, for me. It just feels like um, very, very, um, you know, dystopian. You know, that I think it just feels very um, otherworldly. So I, I don't, I don't like it at all. And you know, when you when the when the train staff are outnumbering the passengers, that's when you've got to think. Hang on a minute, this is just not right. And that's on a regular basis as well. Yeah, it must be it must be just hard, strange. Yeah, yeah I don't yeah, know. Yeah. You're just constantly questioning everything, aren't you? I can oh, imagine yeah. doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's, I guess it's one of those times where, you know, the new normal is what they say this is sort of becoming. And I mean, I don't think that will be the new normal, but it's, it's almost like, you know, gradual transition back to what, how things used to be will take probably a long time. So um, right now, it's currently, hopefully, we're passing through the peak. I'm not Mm. sure exactly how they're assessing the uh, the scientific kind of um, analysis on on the uh, the curve of it, but uh, right now it doesn't look like it's changing anytime quickly. So mm. for now, at least, that seems to be the you know the the kind of default way that the the trains and the transport system is going to be operating. So uh, I just hope it goes back to normal as soon as possible, and um, you know people can kind of get back to their normality and their regimes as quickly as they can, really, because I can imagine it being very debilitating and very frustrating for for, for you know for millions of people. Yeah, very much so. And I'm really pleased that we've had a BBC presenter here who didn't use the word unprecedented. Um, uh, probably the first person not to use that word so far, mate. So well done. I've, I've used it many times <laughs> in the past when talking about it, actually. It uh, is definitely yeah. the word of the lockdown, isn't it? I know. Um, unprecedented, but, yeah, gosh. You know, Gary, I, I want to get to know you and our, you know, hopefully the audience and people watching as well wants to get to know you and think about like work out your journey and listen to how it all started. So let's take us all back to the start. How did your journey to where you are start? And was it like a dream of yours or an aspiration of yours to become a TV presenter? Oh, do you know something? Um, it wasn't a dream of mine at all, James. It was, uh, it was, you know, I very much found my way into the industry and um, I sort of like discovered uh, TV quite late on, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, I initially wanted to be a banker, investment banker. Um, I, yeah, I did my, my first degree was in um, banking and uh, economics and, and finance. Um, and um, yeah, I did like accountancy, like advertising, marketing, all those kind of like areas around business and economics. Um, and um, yeah, kind of like had the vision of being, you know, sort of 
Wolf of Wall Street type character. Maybe not those that exact character, but that kind of <laughs> like that kind of domain. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but the sort of that lifestyle, if you like, the the sort of fast living, you know, like you know, expensive sort of you know uh, cosmetics and you know materialistic types of things. Those the things off, office par- office parties and what, what was it? <laughs> What was in the film where they're throwing the dwarves at the time? Oh my god! No, <laughs> I think I think like I mean obviously those sides of things are the sordid side of things. I think like <laughs> having a nice you know the, the kind of like luxury lifestyle really was something I, I aspired to. And um, yeah, yeah, I kind of you know that's and, and, you know when you're in in like uh, that sort of when you're that age, eighteen, you know, in university, and you kind of want the you know you, you kind of you don't necessarily have a completely like crystal clear vision of what things going to be in you know five ten years time 15 years time so um yeah tv came to be quite late so i, I ended up um i did a master's uh, in um public relations uh, and um international relations as well and like i realized that um i quite liked the um sort of media side of business and um did a lot of work at bbc wales when i was in cardiff um and that was like that was really interesting because it opened my eyes to a lot of journalism and a lot of how production works a lot of how reporting is and I really enjoyed it and I really liked it. Um, and at the same time as well, this was in my last year of university, um, in my fourth year of it. Uh, and like, I just realized that I kind of got a bug for it. And I got like asked to do a question of sport music video as well at the same sort of time. So I was kind of in, in TV as well as working behind the scenes in TV, which is quite random. Um, and hopefully that video will never surface. Uh... But hold on a minute. You got asked to do a question of sport video. A, yeah, like, a, you know, the mystery guest segment they had a long time ago. Yes. I don't know if they still do that anymore. I don't think they, they do. do. They, they do. do do it still. Okay. Yeah. Um, yep, still do it. Um, so yeah, I got asked to be an extra in a in a, in a mystery guest video um, for uh, with Darren Campbell. Darren Campbell was the, was the mystery guest, um, and there were like four of the dancers, and we had to dance to Saturday Night. Uh, no, it wasn't Saturday Night. It was um, Saturday Night Fever. It was um, a Jackson Five. Um, blame it on the boogie. Yeah, I don't know why I'm telling you this. I shouldn't be telling you this because you might go and find it somewhere now. Uh, I'm it's not online, definitely going to try and find it afterwards. It's, it's not online. It's on VHS, believe it or not. Um, back in the day. Uh, so, might, yeah. You might have to explain to some people what VHS is. Old school cassette tapes. <laughs> Old school cassette tapes. Yeah, before, like, just after Beta, I think. Beta, t- oh my God. Um, but yeah, that uh, is going back. It is. It is, yeah. So, um, yeah, like, basically, I kind of, like, realised, you know, the whole ideolo- the ideology of, like, you know, what I was all about, like, what I was trained to be and stuff. You know, you find these things out about yourself as you go along. You know, I think it's not, it's one, it's one of the, you know, doing a course like that and getting into like that sort of industry, you, it's not necessarily very formulaic. Whereas, you know, if you go and study medicine, you go and study, you know, engineering, architecture or whatever it is, um, that's a bit more uh, specific. You kind of know that's the path you're going to go down. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas something along the lines of arts or business or sociology or politics as well, even, you can go into many different types of career. And media is another one of those as an example. Um, and so, yeah, I, I realized that's what I wanted to do and get into that side of things with TV, not necessarily presenting, just being in, in the TV industry. So then I moved to London, uh, got a job with Anton Deck as their runner. Um, so, yeah, it was like a very lucky break that as well. So Anton Deck's runner for a, yeah, a few months, uh, but it wasn't uh, it didn't pay that well. Uh, most runners jobs don't really. So I had to supplement Absolutely. that with the work. Yeah. So I worked in um, I worked in retail, worked in Ted Baker. Uh, to supplement that and then I also worked uh, for the medicines and health regulatory agency as an admin uh, role in an admin role um, so, so what you were you were making those sacrifices and yeah. in your head did you have that clear goal that at that point you were like yeah. right I want to do something in tv yeah yeah I think at that point I was realizing that you know tv and, and media is the way I wanted to go and you know I was so I was trying to make uh make my lifestyle work and you know carry on doing the the media work on the side if you like mm-hmm. by having to you know pay my way by doing the professional work if you like so um mm-hmm. there were there were different uh, avenues i used to pursue it and chase it and um yeah i, I remember because i did my dissertation my end of year project on uh, communications in the tv industry so i made a lot of contacts in that so i had a few people to chase up when i got to london um and um that got published actually it was ahead of its time it's very outdated now but it was at the formulation of ofcom so I was very much at the forefront of research on Ofcom when Ofcom was launched, um, 2003. So, God, it's going back away now. Uh, so, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, so basically, like, uh, uh, when I started doing the under deck work, I, that led to Hell's Kitchen, work on Hell's Kitchen as a researcher, celebrity assistant. And I've got so that was, so sorry, that was then just like a step up then. So yeah. you go from yeah. runner to researcher. Yeah, pretty much. But again, a lot of these roles, like in entertainment and, and you know, and, 
and uh, TV sort of like entertainment, if you like, is very much on contacts and like making an impression. You do a good job in one job, you get referred for another. Um, so it's not necessarily like uh, there's not really a career structure it's just yet. I mean, you can work that up, but this was very early on. So I was just getting what I could, you know, getting anything that was you know available. And I made some really interesting connections. And the, the Hell's Kitchen gig was amazing because um, we uh, I had the most crazy gig. I had the most crazy gig. I was I was in charge of like the um, helping to book the celebrities and get them like organized to come on the show. And they had a show every night for about three or four weeks. And I just remember like we I was in charge of like ferrying the celebrities round on the night for the restaurant and briefing them, giving them drinks, entertaining them, showing them what they had to do and then taking them back out and then having more drinks with them at the end of it. And I just had so I, I remember one night I was drinking with Liam Gallagher, Peter Stringfellow, um, Paul Robinson, former England goalkeeper and Ron Jeremy. And it was the most random bunch of people. And then uh, Yuri Geller as well came up later on, too. Uh, it was the most random, random job and like crazy time ever. Um, that, just, that just sounds yeah. like one of them um, celebrity dinner parties where you oh go, my God. Right, what yeah. celebrities would you have? And you've yeah. literally just labelled them, but you yeah. actually were there with them. Yeah, 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 pretty much. Yeah, yeah. And, and obviously this was very early on in my career as well. So um, I was sort of like thinking, hang on a minute, like, when did this like, when did this become like real? Like, is this actually happening? Like, um, yeah, so it was very, very strange, very surreal. Um, did they listen to you? They did, actually, although a lot of them just want to get hammered. You know, th at those points, you know, they, the, the reason why they're going to that gig is they're getting driven to it. They're, you know, they're getting to go on TV to a big, uh, a big like, entertainment show in the evenings and they're getting free food and drink. So they're just going to make the most of it, as you would do. Um, and then they get driven home. So it's like, you know, everyone's winning. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, that, that, was a, that was a fun gig. And then, and then after that, I moved. I did a, a few more um, other sort of journalism based things like The Guardian I worked for briefly. Uh, and then I got onto a postgraduate at City University to do broadcast journalism. That was an amazing course. That course is done by a lot of people in the news game and the sports game. And it's a very kind of um, known route to get into um, uh, the to get hands on work and practical work in, in the TV and uh, radio industries. And um, this was like 2005 or something. So like two, one and a half years or so, two years of getting myself sorted out. At the same time as this, I was also um, taken on as a um, uh, BBC News kind of um, researcher slash broadcast assistant. Um, and that was freelance. And that was whilst I was doing my course. So I finished my course um, and then I managed to get this gig. Um, well, it was actually that gig was still ongoing. But then at the same time as that gig, I'd, um, I'd sort of was doing I was networking like crazy, doing as many things as possible. And I ended up networking with Children's BBC and then had a um, screen test and an audition for news round a show called news round which is a kids mm -hmm. tv news show and um i just remember being you know, i'd never done anything before on air had to get myself ready I had to like prep myself had to like try and somehow get myself like broadcast standard and um yeah like i managed to get an audition and I, I got like a couple of weeks with them to see how i worked in the team and then worked with a coach and then had an audition and then got that gig really at the end of my course. So landed on my feet massively and just I do feel very privileged and lucky to have got my break and got my opportunity quite early on uh, in that sense, like straight from university. Do you remember that time when you went in for that screen test for Newsround? How you were feeling? What were you expecting going into a studio, seeing lights for the first time and a camera? Yeah. Oh, man. Very daunting. It's very, very daunting. Yeah. Like. Um, I think you take it for granted now because it's the daily routine. But uh, back then, you know, it's it's you know, everything's very intimidating, especially in, on, on a big show like that. You know, you're talking studio setup where it's you know multiple cameras, lights everywhere. You know, you've got people that are queuing you and telling you what to do. You know, people that are behind the scenes directing you and producing you. There's a lot to take in, a lot to take in, and um, it can be it can be very overwhelming at first if you're not used to that i mean no one if you're doing it from nothing you, you're just completely fresh you know to to the whole to the whole thing so you'd have to learn very very quickly i remember like you know thinking at first i was so i was so nervous i was like a rabbit in the headlights and then you gradually find yourself and it takes a long time to find yourself you know as your own you find your own voice find your own personality you know you find your own like rhythm and you know you have to learn very very quickly you have to learn um, you know, a hell of a lot very quickly early on and then keep learning and then keep developing because it's easy to learn quick and then just fall and then not like, you know, take anything on that you've like processed over the last however many weeks it's been. But yeah, it's, it's, it's an intense period. And I just remember thinking it's, it's a very simple swim time. Basically, you either take to it and flourish and do well or, or like, you know, get a lot out of it 
or you find out it's not for you. I think that, um, you know, the, the extreme pressures and emotions that you go through with everything else around it, it's not just people just think you rock up and talk on TV. You have like, everything written for you and done for you. It's not that at all. You know, you have to do the whole thing behind the scenes. You have to get ready for it. You have to prep yourself. You have to deal with your own like reaction to, to live and to doing on air work. It's not, it's not easy. It's really not easy. So yeah, yeah, it was, it was a very difficult, a very difficult time. And also, uh, a time that I feel very privileged to have gone through because it's it's made me it's made more of my character. Did you feel like you were under pressure almost every time you were going on air because you were at that position where you really wanted to impress and you wanted uh, people to like what you're doing? Um, so how did that affect you dealing with the pressure in those situations? Yeah, man, it was there's pressure all the time. Yeah, there was pressure all the time. I think back then um, I felt very I felt like I didn't deserve to be there. Uh, because I was very new from university. I'd done a few bits in the BBC. I was a trainee with ITV before that, um, but I chose to go, chose to stay with the BBC. So I did feel like I, I was um, sort of like I'd earned my way there, but I still felt because there were a lot of experienced people where I was working at the time in that team um, and, you know, in, in and around me too. Um, I just felt very sort of like, um, you know, I felt like I had to prove myself a lot of the time. I felt like it was, um, you know, harder in a way because... Uh, people wanted to to bury you quicker you know there's there's um when you're sort of like the new person going into an office or a new environment and you know people you worry you think to yourself oh, oh you know are they do they think i'm good enough do they think i i should be here uh so you have a lot of doubts and insecurities and you sort of have to deal with that and when you're young i was only what 23 24 at a time 24 i think it was um and um you know that you're still getting used to yourself as an adult back then you know that's not that's not a, a, an easy time for anybody. So you're having to deal with your own personal um, demons as well as having to, you know, l learn on the job and take in this high pressure gig from a young age. And so it's, it's hard, you know, it, it's, I see why a lot of people, I'm not, I'm not in any way saying I was, I was a child star. I'm not in the slightest way saying that at all. But um, I see why people, a lot of people, when they get like TV fame or like a lot of like um, plaudits from a young age why they crack up later on because it's so hard to maintain a level of um, sanity and, and realism when you are um, when you're in that bubble of being young finding yourself but also dealing with a high pressure gig because you can it can very easily go to go get to your head it can very easily um, uh, derail you and you have to know, you have to learn a lot about yourself more than anything in order to do a gig like that early on did it go to your head at all? Because I, I know back then News Round was yeah. a huge show. It was massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's not underplay yeah. it right now. It was huge. We all watched it. What was it 5.30 every day? Yeah, man. It used to be 5.30 every day. Yeah, there you go. 5.30 right. every five. day. 10 past 5. 10 past 5. Or 10 past 5. That's yeah, right. Yeah. And then I, think, yeah. I believe, if I'm neighbors not mistaken, five, na Neighbours followed. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so it was a huge show. Easy to get to your head. How did you keep yourself so grounded? Yeah. Or did you not? I think it was like yeah quarter past five ten past five that sort of time zone yeah um yeah like uh i mean it, it was it was very easy to i would say that you know in terms of like how it how it was what the team was like and um you know what what everybody was like to work with um it was a very grounded team so there was no divas around really there was no one to you, you couldn't get away with being anything you know other than yourself and you had to work in a team you know with people on on the shoots and stories and you know, in the studio environment. So you couldn't get away with being an idiot. Not that anyone was at all. No one was at all. So um, it was a very, very, it was a very lucky team to be working with, really. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it, you know, those sorts of things, you can see how some like TV shows may have more of a reputation for being, you know, a little bit more, um, you know, they, I guess, bigging their presenters up and their presenters getting quite big headed. But no, I, I, it was not at all like that. It was really, um, yeah, it was a really like great team to be with, actually, to be honest. And it has carried. I think that attitude has sort of carried with me through to this day. You've got to always be part of the team. You know, you've got to always, and you've got to be part of the bigger picture. There's no point in you can't work for yourself. It's not an individual's game, even though it might look like an individual's game. It's very much, you know, a, oh, a team effort. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you need the lighting team, you need the sound team, you need the camera guys, you need the producers, the script writers, yeah. the runners, the makeup artists, the hairstylists. Everybody ha does play a part, and if one person isn't playing their part, it can affect the whole team. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I completely get that. Completely understand. Um, but sport is a big passion of yours, yeah. and from news round, I know eventually you made your way through to Sky Sports News. How did yeah. that happen? Yeah, so I did a couple of bits in between that. Yeah, so um, I mean the the, the yeah, it feels like it feels like yesterday, but it also was about 
15 years ago nearly now. Uh, well, well four, 13, 13 years ago, I think. Yeah, I've got to show my age. Um, but yeah, I think from, from that, I've, sport has always been a passion of mine. It's always been an interest. Um, I used to play semi-pro football um, and I've always sort of had an interest in football, you know, and, and particularly and, and sports in general, you know, like Olympic sports, you know, rugby, tennis, cricket. Um, they've always been part of my natural, like kind of talking points with, with friends and with, with, you know, with peer groups. Uh, so that's naturally, I think, an, an interest where journalism and, and you know, sport is, is such a huge area. So um, I kind of followed that passion um, very early on and like did a show called Sports Round, which was a children's TV show as well, uh, related to News Round. And then um, I, I had a couple of other gigs, not necessarily sports related, that were quite fairly big, actually. One was the, the ITV's Now Good Morning Britain was Daybreak. I, I helped to launch that for three years, did sport and I did entertainment and I did um, features on that, which was great fun. Um, so I did that for three or four years and then um, did a bit of this morning as well, non-sport again. And then London Live, which was a channel I helped to launch, mm -hmm. London-focused channel owned by the Evening Standard, um, which I did a mixture of like news features and sport on that. But sports kind of run through everything I've done over the years. And then you know, obviously Sky Sports comes along around sort of 2015, so, uh, around then. Um, yeah, it was a 15 slash 16. Um, and it's uh, it's just the dream gig, you know, like I, I got a, um, I got a kind of screen test for them. And um, yeah, like everything kind of worked out. The shift started coming when they liked me and then just built more and more um, work with them, really, for the last I don't know, last year. It was the, my last year with them, like 2019. But I have very, very fond memories of the place. And I'm very good friends with a lot of the presenters to this day. And you know, it's a really interesting team. It was a very, very tough environment to work in because it's, you know, breaking news, nonstop news. And I did Sky News as well as uh, Sky Sports News um, um, in my time there. So it was three and a half years or so, four years, I think, nearly at Sky. And um, it's the it's it's that and BBC is like the pinnacle of um, of sports broadcasting, really, I think around the world, if I'm honest. Um, so I feel very privileged to have worked for them and, um, you know, having done BBC early on as well as, you know, currently, you, you kind of like appreciate the, the, the standards and, you know, the, the, the story gathering and the, the personalities you get on. Um, and it's a very interesting operation because they, you know, mm. obviously Sky Sports News is a rolling sports news network. So it's, yeah, it's, it's just a machine and it's, there's nothing else really like it in the world. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things where uh, I'm very privileged to have worked with the brands and the uh, and the companies and the broadcasters um, and what they stand for, uh, because it just makes you a better person as well as like a better professional. And so I feel very like humbled and honoured for it, really, in a sense. So yeah, I, I mean, it, it couldn't have, I feel very lucky in the sense that my career has gone the way it has. So hopefully, fingers crossed, touch wood, uh, it, it stays like that. Lucky it's slash... But lucky slash a hell of a lot of hard work. Oh, you thanks, know. man. Yeah, I guess it, right place, it, right time as well, you know? Yeah, you say that. You, you're very humble, Gavin, and you, 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 oh, I got this screen test, I got this. Well, the reason why you got it is because you're good and you worked right, hard. Man. You did, you know, you, you've gone and progressed through so, so much and you, you've set your goal out and you've just gone there to achieve it. And, you know, that doesn't happen just like that. I'm, I'm sorry oh, it doesn't. You know, we know it doesn't. Fun. There are, yes, there are those small stories of people who might have been, maybe know the right person in certain yeah. situations. Um, but honestly, the majority of people like yourself get to where you are because of sheer determination, sheer hard work. So, oh, mate. thank you, man. Yeah, don't ever forget yeah. that. Um, but Sky Sports News, any stories or memories? Any standout moments at all? Um... I mean, oh, gosh, gosh, there's a, I just think like the, the memories for me, like uh, I just, it's, it's always like, it, because of like the nature of what it is, it, it is, uh, it is, it is like a machine, you know, you, you're with like, you're working with some incredible professionals, you're working with some incredible people. Um, and um, there's just, there's, there's, you know, there's always like, I'm amazed at how slick it was really. It just very much sort of like ticked along, worked really, really well. All the presenters for me and like, you know, some of the guys that I worked with there were so supportive early on because it's, you know, you go into an opportunity like that in a gig like that, it's, it's very daunting. It can be quite, you know, um, hard to fit in, but everybody there is so welcoming, so lovely. Um, so I feel very honored to have done it. And I feel like, you know, happy to have met and, and work with the people I work with. But in terms of like, I'm just trying to think like, not really anything like too spectacular. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure that uh, I don't know if I was there long enough really to be able to sort of say what anything, 
kind of like crazy or mad was that happened behind the scenes there. But I just think, yeah, I mean, it's just it's one of those places where it's like a, you know, it's, it's a culture and it's a lifestyle. And, um, you know, it's, everyone there is, it's like a family, you know, it's, and it's the same where, you know, anywhere else you work in TV, it's like everybody looks after one another, everyone's there for one another. It's a very family oriented environment. Um, and yeah, I had, a, I had a blast there really. So yeah, I mean, I, yeah, that, it's just a very, very positive place to be. Oh, that's great. And I, I have a memory from, so I, I actually went for a screen test in 2010 yeah, uh, at Sky Sports News, um, and I was literally just starting out as a presenter. I had to pinch myself that I even got the call to come in. Um, was just fully like, just nervous, just excited. You know, this was my dream to be at Sky Sports News, and I thought, my God, I can't believe I've I've got an opportunity here. Now you you pass over your screen test, go yeah, the screen test, and got it. I went for the screen nah. test, and um, at the time, stupidly, I'd gone out for dinner the night before with a friend of mine who works for, who's working kind of on and off the Sky, and he told me how much Sky presenters at that point were being paid, and let me tell you, it was a lot of money, yeah, and a lot more money than I'd ever seen. So it just got into my head. I started spending the money and started thinking, well, if I get it, I can get this, I can get this house, I can have a nice car, yeah, like completely. Uh, it wore myself out, and uh, my screen test experience in 2010 was very, very different. I was oh, right. <laughs> petrified, nervous, completely just blew it, basically. Uh, but that was purely down to inexperience. It was down to just not – I wouldn't necessarily say not working hard enough. I just felt like I was at a position where I was very fortunate, I felt, to get the audition, and I just wasn't really – prepared enough and experienced yeah. enough to be able to make that step forward so the fact you did it is oh, fantastic um, Thanks, and it's great and then you've gone over to BBC now I'm I was trying to wrap my brains I was thinking there can't have been that many presenters that have gone from Sky Sports News to BBC Sport at all you've got to be one of very very few that have made that change um, why did that change come about um, I, I think, you know, BBC has always got a special place in my heart, you know, so I've, um, you know, I started out there, um, you know, I, I remember, um, you know, obviously the standards that BBC has is like globally renowned. Um, and, and, um, I felt like, uh, after, I think it's important to keep yourself fresh as well. So, uh, it's, it's, you know, the, the, the team and like the operation and the, and the way that they, they are run are very, very different. Um, but having said that, I've, the BBC has always got like a, a special hold for me. It's, it's one of those places where, um, you know, you know that the people you're operating with and you're working with are just like, you know, incredibly high standards. And I had like a yearning to go to go back and work for them. And so I really wanted to I really wanted to kind of do that and like make the most of it. And, it's, and the place as well, with the BBC is where, that they are making a lot of good moves and a lot of big um, have a lot of big ideas and have a lot of like strong um idea uh, strong goals and strong visions and i'm not saying that sky didn't because they they do as well but it was just the an opportunity that came to me at a time when i was really open to it and um i just felt like it was a, a nice thing to do and change the scene up as well to go from a you know working in london for however many years to go to to go to manchester to try that scene out there and uh, adapt to that environment i just feel it's important to keep yourself fresh by flourishing and moving around um, not like all the time, but it's just good to keep your skills up and to, you know, m make new connections, make new contacts, um, work in different environments, challenge yourself, push yourself different boundaries. Um, and, you know, a, a, an organization like the BBC is only getting stronger and stronger and bigger and bigger. And so um, it's an opportunity to, to grow with that organization. Um, you know, and having gone back, have it after being through all the other organizations and because uh, I also used to do CBS, an American network as well, CBS News, um, not necessarily doing sport, but doing uh, news and features for them. So having the experience and like doing doing the different shows and, the, and working with the different organizations to go back to a place uh, like the BBC, which is um, renowned for being quite, um, uh, I guess, um, strong in its values and um, they have their set ways of doing things. I wanted to be able to go there and say I've got a lot more experience now. And I, I would hope to make an impact there. So it's been, I don't know, a year or so, um, but really enjoying it. And it's a really good opportunity and good team and good people that I'm with. Now, I think just speaking to you now, obviously, I know you before anyway, but speaking to you now, you're always looking at something new. You always want to you know, put your hand into something and do something different and challenge yourself. And 
we met because you'd set up a podcast. You started a podcast called yeah. Manzilla and yeah. about tackling men's issues. And I guess the forefront of that is mental health awareness. How important is it for you, this project? Oh man, it's um, yeah, it's it, we yeah we met through that, and like you came on one of our shows, which was really uh, kind of you. And the mental health awareness um, I, idea and angle is something I wanted to tra- tackle and track for a long time. And so I had this uh, had the idea of Manzilla and um, the, the men's uh, issues related um, side of things uh, probably for the last year and a half, two years or so. And I uh, wanted to try and start a vehicle um, and and start a platform that would address some really really uh, important and and tough issues that a lot of guys would struggle to maybe articulate and to, to bring up. And so um, the mental health side of things is a huge aspect of it. Um, it's to do with status, to do with identity and to do with like uh, how we feel in ourselves as, as guys. Um, and I remember we, when we, we did our show, you came on, you spoke to us about um, how, um, you know, the idea of hustling and how to sort of get on up and, you know, work as a, um, as a as a media kind of um, figure, if you like, uh, and a lot of industries, um, you know, are going more t- along the lines of being quite gig economy based, and so you know the the changes to a lot of men's psych and a lot of men's um, thinking, if you like, is having to adapt and change, and so those things like that, you know, talking about how to make yourself different, make yourself current, make yourself kind of you know appealing. That it's important for, for 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 guys and for everyone in a sense to think like that and to be able to adapt and change. And mental health is like you know a, almost like a um, it's such an important aspect and 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 um, kind of like key thing to our own um, souls now. And you know previously I think it was never really thought of or, to, or looked at. Whereas the last few years has now become like a a huge huge like kind of area of interest and um the more we, are, we understand our own psych and mental health um the better it is for us as people to get on up and live our lives as best we can and so that, yeah it was it was very much long-winded answer but i think um yeah just to, to address guys concerns and issues to make them uh feel better about themselves because there's you know as we know about the stats you know the majority of um sort of 35 to 45 year old um guys who are committing suicide is the numbers are, are only going up so um we're trying to address that and trying to make things um more accessible and easier for guys to get help and to talk to people more than anything why do you think the numbers back then weren't as high as they are now do you think it was because it wasn't reported do you think people weren't talking enough do you think it wasn't necessarily a thing that people uh, established or knew actually existed well, what do you think uh, the reasons are um, I think that it wasn't, I don't think people, I don't think many people knew, uh, how to talk about it really. That's a good question, James. A really good question. Um, and I think that, um, what's happened now is that I, I, I say this to people whenever, whenever I kind of talk about this issue and, you know, and, and panels and stuff like that and, and, and talk about it to various like people who are interested in Manzilla, I think it's a ticking time bomb for a lot of men. They may not feel like they're, they're in it right now or, you know, that it's aimed at 25 to 45 year old Manzilla, but it's, it's like a point where you think to yourself, oh, I feel okay, I feel all right. But then at some point there will be a time when you may not feel as comfortable in your own skin as, as you probably were. Uh, and that can, lead, that can be down to many things. Could be down to your, your you know, change in physicality, could be down to a change in job, change in status, you know, relationships and what have you. There are loads of little factors that can play into that. And the mental health, it, mental health is the byproduct and the, um, the thing that suffers the most from it. That's the thing that, that, that is most susceptible to anything to do with change. And change is something I think a lot of guys struggle with. And over the years, change um, has become more and more prominent in our lives to do with work, to do with professionality, to do with um, culture, uh, to do with how uh, the workplace has changed, what you can say, what you can't say. Um, and a lot of guys, particularly in the 25 to 45 year old age group, don't necessarily like or want to change. Um, and so I think that it, that's probably the most per- pertinent thing about all that. And mental health has been, um, I'm not sure when, the, when, the, when it was sort of like properly noticed, but the stats and I think that the campaigns around it for the last maybe, maybe three or four years ago is when I think it hit peak sort of like awareness levels. Um, and now it's become ingrained in normality that this is the trend. So, um, yeah, I would say that back three or four years ago, maybe it was when that was when the, the, I think the, the wave of it and when when I think you sort of started seeing people talking about it, you know, really big names talking about their mental health and talking about struggling with it as well. 
that's when I think it started becoming a thing rather than just like a depressed guy going on on TV or in the magazine or wherever you see um, uh, you know you're, you're wherever you consume your content like talking about these issues where I think when it's becoming like so when the numbers and the stats are backing up what a lot of like high profile people are saying that's when I think it becomes a thing. Do you think there's a correlation between mental health issues and the line of work that you and I uh, take on and are working on. I mean, if we, if, you know, very tragically, we look back only, what, a few months ago with the passing of Caroline Flack. Yeah. And you're somebody who's in the spotlight, in front of the telly, in front of the nation, struggling with her own challenges behind the scenes. Uh, we've seen it. it. It's incredibly sad. It's incredibly tough. But is there a correlation between the two? Um, yeah, I mean, oh, gosh, I mean, that, that was such a sad story. Um such a sad story. I, I knew her a little bit. I didn't I wouldn't say I was friends with her, but I'd worked with her a long, long time ago when she was in CBBC as well. And it's just so tragic. And I think that, um, you know, in different elements of television and different elements of the media and, you know, particularly with social media, the rise of social media and the rise of kind of, you know, likes and status and how to, you know, who's doing better than who, that kind of thing, anxiety, all those kind of little, little factors play into it really. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I think that, um, I think it's probably. I think we are probably more susceptible to um, you know changes and, and issues to do with um, that in in our game because it's it's a continually changing field. So mm-hmm. um, it, it depends on how. I think it depends on how you know you sort of view things. Really, um, I think it depends on how you view um, you know uh, I guess success. How you view what your career is doing. How you view what kind of others think of you. Um, yeah, so I, I do think it's it's probably become more heightened uh, off the back of this. And, you know, shows like, you know, Love Island, if you like, and, you know, the reality TV shows uh, are based around playing on people's insecurities and playing up to, um, you know, people's kind of instincts around but, their, but, their mental health. But that's no different to what we've seen in the past. You know, what Big Brother first launched in 2000, yeah. I believe. Yeah. yeah. You know, we've seen these reality shows for, well, certainly in my life, to what, 20-odd yeah. years? Yeah. So so what's the difference between what's happening now on Love Island to back then, 20 years ago? Um, well, I think back then, um, you could almost argue that the games were probably more manipulative as well in Big mm-hmm. Brother. And, and um, in, if, if you like, if you kind of look at it from a, you know, a game-playing sense, you could, you could almost you know, see that producers may be wanting to play off the contestants against the public to see what the public opinion is of that. Um, and I, get, I, I don't know, maybe it's something to do with um, the, um, the, the mindsets of, of the Love Island generation that are perhaps more inclined to become more anxious. Maybe that, that generation, that age group is, more, is less robust in their mental health. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, Big, Big Brother and other reality shows have done these types mm-hmm. of experiments before. And, you know, maybe the, maybe the aftercare for that hasn't been as highlighted as what Love Islands is right now. Love Islands is under the microscope, you know, like nothing like ever before. So it's, you know, Love Island cannot get away with not looking after the contestants as much as um, other shows. They have, to, they have to look after their contestants in, in ever so much more detail now. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I think that um, maybe back then it wasn't so much of an, an issue, whereas the last few years, you know, reality tv and, and entertainment tv and sensational tv if you like has become more of a mainstream programming um and i guess that the guess that big brother wasn't quite so much as mainstream as love island i think maybe the focus on social media nowadays is a completely yeah. different kettle of fish of what it was back in 2000 um i did a show back in 2006 7 and i received no aftercare afterwards as well there was absolutely nothing uh, yeah, I think maybe I had one phone call after I got back, um, yeah. and I've been wa- been away for three months. It was a big challenge. It was a big change, but it wasn't really a again. It wasn't really a thing, and we and I had struggles. I will openly admit that I did have struggles during those phases and those times. And coming out of that was difficult. I had to deal with stuff in the press, some stuff in the public uh, eye, which was really tricky. And you needed that support. Now, now we've got you. Know, everything's amplified because of social media. Yeah, uh, it really is. It's amplified by so much and the pressures are right there. They're current. You turn your phone on, you got notifications, something comes up and it's hard not to see them. It's hard not to read them. So it is tough, but I think 
you know, seeing what you're doing with Manzilla, I think it's really important. I think it's great Thanks, that man. you're bringing eyes to an, an issue that's, as you know, is really close to my heart. Something I yeah. am so passionate about, so passionate about improving. And I really wish there is so much more done. Um, I have these dreams and aspirations that we include a mental health section in schools as part yeah. of the education, because I think it's there where, where people need to learn the skills to be able to look yeah. after their own mental health when they do get to adult life, uh, whether it's by creating structures in your life, um, routine, um, talking more, you know, be more open with family, friends, et cetera, about how you feel it, be more true to yourself with it. Because I don't think people are. And uh, I yeah. think that's the biggest challenge that people feel afraid to talk. So it's great to see what you're doing. I think it's uh, well, absolutely man. fantastic, mate. Um, Thank you. But but that isn't the only content creating you're doing. Um, if you're uh, watching Instagram and Gavin's Instagram oh or Twitter, you never know what you're going to expect to see with Gavin. Um, Gavin, what is it about entertaining that you love so much? Oh, dude. Um, I think you might be referring to the videos, the dancing videos. Um, Surely not. <laughs> Surely yeah, not. No, I, think, I just think like yeah, maybe it's because of the current situation we're in um, with, um, with uh, quarantine uh yeah and, and so to go to dance yeah oh yeah god yeah that one I, I just, you know what it's just one of those things that you see a couple of people do and you think oh, i'll have a go at it and see what happens <laughs> um i just think it's it's important to try and get the, a lighter side in there you know at times it's important to try and just you know show a bit of you know what you kind of like are like away from the the cameras and like the you know the, the kind of usual newscaster demeanor um so and i'm always quite you know i'm quite a fun chap i like to start just to have a bit of a laugh and mess around and like not not take things um too seriously at times so it's it's important to just showcase that as well and you know if people like it then fine if not if people get really offended by it then i'll i might not do it again but um so far not not too many people are offended just yet maybe the more i do the more they will get offended but um yeah no it's just one of those things where i just try and like you know Try and sort of like just 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 keep it real every now and again. Keep it like sort of um, keep the real me sort of in there still. Uh, but yeah, which, I, I do enjoy being creative great. as well. Thanks, man. Yeah, well, it's great. You've got to show your personalities. You know, when you're on on these TV shows, obviously, if you're reading the news, you're reading the news, you're reading the sport. It's really it's a tough little challenge to try and then add aspects yeah. of your personality in there, which I know you try and we all try at times, but it's really tough to get across. So. Being able to show that side of yourself, I think it's, I mean, it's great. I think Thanks, people man. should embrace that. And like yeah, I've yeah. done, I love it. I love your videos. I oh, think they're brilliant. You're a and I watch man. every Thank single you. one and it makes me <laughs> laugh every single time. So, oh, you're um, a superstar, dude. You're a superstar. <laughs> now talk about social media. A couple more things. I won't keep you too long, but uh, That's right. talk about social media. Have you had to deal with trolls before? Uh, so, yeah. How, how, how have you coped with that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not, it's nothing like, um, you know, other people have in the sense where, um, you know, I'm not like, um, I'm not a celebrity where um, people are, you know, watching you like a Davina McCall type, say, or like a, I don't know, like a Gordon Ramsay type or someone like that, you know, where you're, you're kind of famous for being sort of like a personality or like a, a famous for being famous, if you like, or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so, you know, that, that can bring in all sorts of flat. People want to comment on everything to do with you in that sense. But yeah, I've had like, you know, I've had a bit of racial abuse before. Um, not loads, but every now and again, you get a bit of racial abuse. Um, you say and, that so casually. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I mean, it, well, I don't really take it. I don't really take it too, uh, too seriously because, um, you know, having grown up in an area where um, I was the only... Uh, ethnic minority in my town if you like I'm kind of used to being um, I mean I had a tougher upbringing basically I'm used to hearing the names hearing the hearing what people say um, and so when it comes to you on social media it doesn't happen often it doesn't happen often at all but you sort of just think ah what an idiot you maybe call them out if you like but I don't really um, I don't really take it seriously at all and it's if anything it just shows that um, people are um, either jealous or or kind of very um just you know hateful of the way that you are doing things and that's their problem not yours so for me i just try and i try, it's not it's not nice to see it doesn't happen often uh you just get the uh yeah, n word the p words whatever you want to sort of like um uh sort of say really around like anything to do with negative racial connotations i've had people saying like you're taking an english person's job that kind of thing um yeah yeah it just it kind of really kind of really annoys me really but at the same time um 
you know, it's, it's quite it's quite funny because um, these sorts of people live in a different century. Um, and so, yeah, I just I have no I don't want to entertain these idiots. So, uh, yeah, that's probably the extent of the most serious trolling I've had. Uh, I get like banter trolling, but that's just fine. I'm all right with that. That's fine. But no, no one's like um, no one's really I mean, no one's really properly trolled, properly trolled, you know, and if they do, then, you know, I kind of think sometimes a lot of people are they, they just have nothing else to do really and so if they're going to troll you then all right let them troll as long as it doesn't go down that too serious a line i'm like fine with it i just let it go it's fine it doesn't bother me do you think your strength to deal with these situations and those comments comes from your background and how you were brought up obviously like you said as one of a, a minority at the time in an area that was yeah. very different yeah um i suppose so i suppose so it, it doesn't you know we're in 2020 now. Um, and so therefore you would expect, um, a sort of degree of, um, integration and understanding and a bit more harmony. Um, but when, you know, when I was growing up, it was, you know, West Midlands, an area called Kidderminster and it was, it was fun. It wasn't rough, but it was not as diverse as many other places. And you stuck out like a sore thumb, uh, wherever you went, you were very much the center of attention everywhere you went. Um, and so, you know, I, I was lucky. I had a very, very strong group of mates, and I played um, football for my for the for the team there too. So um, I was sort of quite in, in a popular group. So, and my family as well. My mum and dad were quite um, highly regarded in society there. So it wasn't necessarily like we were the outsiders in a village at all. We were very much part of the community. But you did find it more acute when um, you were sort of like the only. Um, black or brown face in a place where you know it's literally all white um so yeah i mean it, i would say that it probably helped me out in the sense that i kind of i'm used to being um i'm used to hearing everything i'm used to hearing the worst i'm used to like dealing with the worst and used to kind of like um kind of not not kind of like reacting to it if that makes sense um although i don't know now i think i'm more likely to react to it than back then um because i've just i just my tolerance levels for, for things like that now i just like i just don't have any tolerance for it at all none so um but yeah yeah i, I would say that it's made me made me kind of more um yeah I, I built me up to be more resilient towards it yeah for sure that's it's tough to deal with and it's like you said it's 2020 it just yeah it's so frustrating to hear it it's so but it's still infuriating it's still but it is still happening and we all know it's still happening yeah. and again we go back to social media and yeah I, I, it's one of my pet peeves and it's my pet hate is that social media companies don't do enough. Uh, yeah. They don't do enough to stop it. They don't do enough to prevent it. And the day needs to come where if you want to sign up and have a Twitter profile, no problem. You send your ID in that yeah. gets scanned and then you say whatever you want. And if you want to say stuff like that, we'll expect a knock on the door to come yeah. through and your, your life potentially could then your career could be over because of pure stupidity. So yeah. that's what I think needs to happen. It needs to happen fast. And um, yeah, I'm sorry you have to go through that at that's, times. It's absolutely sorry. ridiculous. Um, no, it's, uh, it doesn't happen often. It really doesn't. But it's just, there's a, you know, an extremely small minority who are still out there. And, um, you know, I, I was watching that documentary that uh, Robbie Lyle did um, mm. for, uh, I think it was about football fans, like the reality of football fans of what they're, you know, what they're like. And Robbie Lyle's Arsenal fan TV. He's the guy who's behind Arsenal fan TV. And um, you should see some of the comments that he was getting. It's just vile. It really, really is just vile. And, you know, for that thing to still be happening today, uh, it's just, it's disgraceful. It's absolutely disgraceful. Um, and there's no other, there's no other way to, to kind of call it. You know, it's just um people like that don't don't um yeah they just don't deserve any airtime whatsoever so uh but I, i'm not sure what the solution is because there's, there's been so much talk about what the solution mm -hmm. should be for however many years now and it seems to be if anything just as prominent as it was 10 years ago so um yeah you know i don't know how i don't know what needs to be done what what needs to be done to stamp all that sort of stuff out but it's just i don't know i think uh i think that uh, you know I think that probably um, there needs to be another look at it at some point, you know, when the season does start again. It's just, you know, the Raheem Sterling stuff as well we saw recently, you know, it, how on earth does this sort of thing like still happen? And, you know, what can you, what can you do about it really? Do you, it's a really difficult question asking you this. Do you think the media have a responsibility as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are many like um, many facets to, what the media can do um 
does the media reflect society or does society um, take its cues from the media? So that's, that's, uh, the, that's the most, I guess, interesting line to kind of like put to, to people really. Um, but the media often, you know, if you look at newspapers particularly, then they have a responsibility to treat and, and, and look at uh, black players and uh, minority players with, you know, the same regard as they would with a white player. Um, and that is something that I don't think has been done over the years. You know, there's racial stereotypes that are still um, provocative throughout a lot of reporting in lots of newspapers, not just the typical tabloids or the ones that you might think. Uh, it's, it's kind of endemic in the whole system. Uh, broadcasters to a point, I would say that broadcasters are quite impartial. I have to be mm -hmm. honest, I do think that because um, the way that we are, the way that we report, the way that we do things is, is different to how newspapers report. Mm -hmm. And so the, the semantics and like the meaning and the undertones are much less um, nuanced than, than a, a publications who are maybe trying to drive a certain audience. Whereas we, particularly BBC, we're very, very straight, very impartial. You know, it's all about um, the story, the facts, nothing to do with anything around like opinion, mm -hmm. really around a, a certain player, you know. Um, and I do think that I do think like um, certain publications probably could have been better, but I do believe they're trying to be better. Um, but having said that, there are instances where the publications have portrayed certain types of players in positive lights. So it's that might not get the, the same coverage as, you know, when they negatively portray somebody. Of course, it wouldn't. But mm -hmm. um, it, it is important to note that, you know, it's not all just bad stuff from the media. The media do, do some great work. You know, there's anti-racism initiatives that, you know, a lot of the newspapers have been behind and have backed. Um, so you have to commend them for that. So it is a two way street. Mm -hmm. It's not just media's media kind of like reporting playing a you know a, a terrible role on how a player is perceived not been some great instances with that but at the same time they do do some good work you've worked for itv cbs london live bbc uh sky sports what's your ambitions next what's your what do you aspire to be doing next um i, I don't really necessarily have any like specific um it's the most specific... awful question i've just posted no, as well, no, it's, not, it's, it's nothing specific <laughs> really no i mean to be honest the way that the way it is just to just to get back to normality is the key i think um mm -hmm. and just developing and like getting better in my own my own skin really and doing the best i can with uh, the bbc and like making sure that we are um you know breaking and developing and owning uh, bigger stories um and uh yeah making sure that we're kind of you know still the number one place to come to really for all for all um, sports news and, and sports entertainment and becoming bigger with younger audiences. That's that's the key goal, really. I think that's the um, that's the thing I want to try and develop. And that's the thing I want to try and become, really, I'd say, in, in that sense. But nothing specific, man, because I think don't think you can. I'm always a big believer in in going with the flow in terms of your own personal career goals. You've got to see what is right for you at the right time and then move with the right move, uh, move with the right um, intentions. Um, so I think that if you can maximize where you are, do the best you can, have the best attitude, um, give it everything you can and, and do a really good job, then the rest works itself out. I think that's very wise words, mate. Thanks, man. Yeah, very, yeah, very yeah. wise. Very, very wise and great advice as well. Uh, Gavin, thanks so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Uh, and everybody watching, follow Gavin on Instagram, <laughs> Twitter. I will put his handle up on the video. Uh, give him a follow because you won't be disappointed. Well, oh, mate, that's big words. Big words there. Thanks, James. Appreciate so no it. pressure. So you, it means you just got to produce some more dancing videos and we'll see you on Strictly soon, I'm sure. Oh, dude, I've got, I've got to up my game for that if I do that <laughs> one day, maybe. <laughs> mate, legend. Thanks. Cheers, mate. <laughs>